very much and I, I really am delighted to be here today because this is a day which is rather unusual for speakers in a conference because it's actually very little to do with us and it's all to do with you because our interest in this whole area is about what people think and what you think, what everyone thinks is incredibly valid and valuable for us to understand. So that's why it's an unusual conference and certainly one that I'm very much looking forward to. What I want to do just very briefly is to set out a little bit about why Scotland, why are we talking about this here? And do we have any information that would give any of you some confidence that we're actually quite good at research we're quite good at clinical research, and that when we engage in it, that there's some outcome that we're pleased about, something that benefits not just individuals or even a researcher from their own reputation, but benefits whole populations of people, not just here, but also information that we gather here can help other people globally in terms of their health problems and uh, looking at better health outcomes. Um, and actually I should just say there's also another spin out and that as well as being a very big health opportunity for Scotland there's an enormous economic opportunity for us here uh, in two ways one by reducing the cost of treating a nation which unfortunately has rather a bad health record that's one thing and that's unless we do something about it it's going to get more costly to treat us and it's going to get worse, so we need to address that. It's absolutely crucial. Um, and also, we need to see our young businesses flourish. Flourish. We need to get the translation of all that knowledge we're producing actually out into making a difference economically for small businesses, employing people <coughs> at things that we're really good at and securing our future. So, uh, are we any good at research? Well. This data doesn't come from me, because I would try and persuade you, of course, I might be biased, that we are very good at research. But this is an independent analysis. So if you look at, um, relative to our GDP, the impact of Scotland's research is number one in the world. It's way ahead of the rest of the UK, the US, France, Germany, Japan, all those countries you might think are very research intensive. Well, they are but the impact of what we do here is way ahead of what they, what they do. That's astonishing. So the scale of what we do is necessarily small because of our size. The impact is massive. People know about what we do and they talk about what we do. So that's that bottom bullet point, citations. When we publish papers, the rest of the world pays attention and looks up and, and sees what, what is it we've been doing. So we have 1.8% of world citations. It doesn't sound much, but we're only 0.1% of the world's population. So actually, it's a bit of a, a positive thing for us. I'm going to focus on health sciences and life sciences and clinical sciences this morning. But just to remind you that we're actually excellent in a, a whole area of other sciences, and that brings benefits too. And I might comment on that where appropriate. So, just looking at our health sciences, our life sciences, this underpins our ability to do research that will have impact on health and treatment. So if we look at just that middle banner of salsa there, salsa is something that isn't copied, well, it's not, it would like to be copied, but it's not found anywhere else in the world. It's a collaboration by competing universities to work together and have an internationally competitive research program and to attract the best from around the world to come and work here in Scotland to do life sciences. So it's the Scottish Universities Life Science Alliance, a front door into our research in Scotland, which is quite something. It makes it very easy for people to work with us. It needs to probably be easier. That's a, a, a goal that we've got in mind. We've got a whole number of areas, so we have, for example, at Dundee, and I can't mention everything, so I'm just picking one or two, a drug discovery unit there that works with industry and with academia to be able to generate information about new potential drugs that could be used to address diseases, or to take diseases and find ways of treating them. 
uh, because that hasn't previously been available. <coughs> this is a fantastic facility and something that any one of us in Scotland, a researcher, can go and use. And on the back of that, and I feel we should be very proud of this, the, that drug discovery unit also has the capability to look at what we would call neglected diseases, particularly diseases of the developing world, where drug companies aren't so interested because those people can't buy the developed drugs. And that's done at Dundee on the back of being able to commercialise uh, the diseases that we all suffer from, because in relative terms in the world, we're indeed very, very rich here. So if you look at some other things, our cancer research, cancer research is fantastic. One of the main genes involved in cancer, P53 gene and certain types of cancer, that gene discovered here. Uh, lots of ways of understanding how cells signal to each other and what happens when, when something clamps onto a cell, what happens at the genetic level discovered here in Scotland. Um, at my own university in Aberdeen, we're very strong in imaging. So we've been able to take part, for example, in the Scottish, I Scottish Imaging Network, a platform for scientific excellence. It's a fantastic acronym, Synapse, I have to say. The person who thought that one up should be given a medal. Um, but the ability to image, that's really important. So things that you have heard of, like CT scanning or MRI scanning, and again, ultrasound, all of these things delivered here in Scotland and used globally now. But it needed people to get engaged in that, to be able to trial this technology to ensure that it was uh, available and commercialised uh, around the world. Bottom right, I'll just mention Claude Wiszczyk, who's doing some extremely interesting research around looking at Alzheimer's disease, something that as we grow older and we survive the many other diseases um, facing us, we have uh, the spectre of getting very old and perhaps getting some of the dementias, and unfortunately getting some of those dementias when we're younger. So looking at new treatments for dementia. Imagine being able, I, I'm sure, I know there'll be a lot of you in the audience who will know somebody with Alzheimer's. Imagine if you could halt the progression of that disease and even turn it backwards. Uh, how good would that be? Not just for quality of life, but again, it would have a great financial impact. <laughs> So lots of research related to health. What, what has it delivered though? Um, can, can we point to anything and say, yeah, people getting involved in a research trial has made a difference. So I'm going to mention just a few examples, again, all in Scotland. Um, what we've got here is a light emitting plaster. You're looking at this plaster on someone's arm. And this has been developed in order to be able to treat skin cancer. And it was done as a very interesting collaboration by um, two professors, one in physics at St Andrews University and one in dermatology at Dundee University. So I mentioned earlier that we're not just good at life sciences, we're good at other areas of research. Physics is one of them. And because we're small and we're so research intensive, it's really easy for us to speak to each other and develop new technologies which, again, we need volunteers to be able to work with to see how these technologies work and whether we can improve them. So this uh, Ambulite technology, as it's called, is a way of reducing the discomfort of treating uh, skin cancer and increasing effectiveness. So there's an example of our research being put into action. I mentioned the University of Aberdeen and over the years the scanning technology at the University of Aberdeen has allowed us to do whole body scanning, non-invasive scanning and um, for, for most of us we just take this for granted now but being able to effectively look inside a body, perhaps to look at uh, a tumour, where it is, how it's growing, how it's positioned, all of these things utterly fantastic and available uh, to all of us on the NHS in Scotland. So again, we need to see how can we refine that imaging? How can we provide even more information from it? And we need to work with people um, who give us permission to allow us to be able to test these things out. And actually, I just thought I would stick this in as well, this Medipix detector system. I'm mentioning it because I said we're great to other areas of science and 
Scotland is number one in the world in space science. Now, that probably will surprise you. It certainly surprised me, and I thought I should know about that sort of thing. But number one in the world, again, volume very small. But if you go to the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in, in Geneva in Switzerland, uh, that whole enterprise is there to look for a particle, the Higgs boson, that was talked about here in Scotland by Peter Higgs. Uh, and hopefully, in the next 18 months, we might have some more information about that. But there's an awful lot of Scots re leading the research at CERN. And people think, well, what's the relevance of it? The relevance is, is that there are offshoots, particularly around imaging and detection systems. And here, the Medipix detector system, here looking at the image of a shell, but now the detector system is being used to look at other imaging, particularly retinal imaging. Again, big health impacts. Top right here, this is um, lab in a pill, is what this is being uh, referred to as. So this little object here, it's tiny. It's like a, a little pain relief tablet that you might take. And what you could do with it, developed at Glasgow University by somebody working in electronics as well as somebody working in healthcare, is that you could pop a pill and it could go through your body and transmit, and does transmit, information, direct information about what it's seeing in the body to the clinician standing outside. So for things, for example, such as bowel cancer, which can be hard to detect, then as this travels through the body and ultimately the bowel before it's excreted, it's reporting back all the time what it sees. And this kind of nanomedicine is a fabulous opportunity, obviously not just for us in Scotland, but for us generally. Um, so that imagine just taking, let's say, pills for blood pressure control, for example, and having those as well wirelessly transmitting information back to the clinic about Actually, she's worried about her blood pressure, but she should be worried about the state of her arteries or that nasty ulcer she's got in her stomach or whatever it happens to be. Um, so you could see the possibilities there. Um, Touch Bionics. So here's a medical device company. Now, Touch Bionics have developed a fantastic... It's like a computer brain interface so that if I, at the moment, told you that I had had one of my, arm, my, one of my hands amputated at the wrist and you had to guess which one, you couldn't really tell. They look pretty much, I hope you think, they look pretty much the same. That is because they are the same. But if I was wearing one of these touch bionics, you, could, you wouldn't tell. That's a fantastic thing for somebody who's had an amputation. And now they have developed a new system where there are just finger amputations, uh, pro-digit, to allow those to be used. And as you might imagine in this world of I everything, then you can get, uh, you could actually have, if you like, that rather mechanical looking thing, which to me would be a little bit scary on a night out if you started shaking somebody's hands with that. But you can get an eye skin that covers it, that matches your other hand exactly, hence the reason you just can't tell. And just for interest, uh, this has been used a lot in America. It's been taken up a lot over there. And the American military, where obviously there has been a lot of um, lower limb amputation, they always reject the eye skin. They like the mechanical hand. Interesting psychology there. And that's really what is not just fun, but important for us to find out about what interests people, what motivates them, what do they like, what do they not like. Uh, and finally, why have I put this up? Um, I've just put it up because it's a lovely picture. It's, um, it's the Orion uh, constellation, and uh, it's called the Flame Nebula. And I put it up because here in Edinburgh, we make the kit that the rest of the world uses to look at the universe. And the kit, in this case, was a large telescope called the Vista Telescope, and it allows us to image very distant galaxies. And in fact, this one is a star nursery. It's where baby stars are born. And it tells us a lot about our own universe to understand what's happening here. And you might think, yeah, OK, so she has wandered a little bit off the point. Not really, because the technology that's used to image this in such detail, so far away, is technology we can capture and translate into medical research. 
So it's complementary to the imaging that I was telling you about earlier. So we have so much knowledge and potential here that we could do something extra special by translating it into the medical or the health arena. So what are the opportunities? Well, for me, the future opportunities in drug development are around using genomic information. So previously, drugs have been developed in a very traditional way, but often not by using the genetic information of the individual. And actually, there is an opportunity lost there because it would probably surprise you, maybe even shock you to know that 30 to 70 percent of the drugs that are prescribed are not particularly effective in the patients to whom they're given. And that's because they're generic drugs. They're not tailored to your health and your genetic background. And some of you may already know of the example in breast cancer of the drug Herceptin, for example. Herceptin works very effectively, but only if you have a certain genetic background and you're expressing certain markers in your breast cancer cells. If you're not expressing those markers, the Herceptin will not work for you. And it's actually a really negative thing to give somebody a drug that doesn't work for them because then their health will deteriorate and they're not getting effective treatment. So what we want to try and think of is tailoring that information to the individual. And this is the goal for the developed world, is to develop this stratified or personalized medicine. So you keep the, the two terms are used interchangeably. So it's a medicine personalized for you and your genetic background. So, how do we do that? Well, we need genetic information. We need to understand which genetic backgrounds will be able to respond to a particular <coughs> drug, perhaps, or may be susceptible to a particular illness. And we do have lots of information there. And that's all arisen through individuals taking part in clinical research. And what does it mean for them? It, it sometimes means that all they have to do is give a sample of their tissue and that's it as far as they're concerned. It can be a lot more complicated and we'll describe that as the conference goes on. But the research can deliver us these medicines which will target us, will be much more specific for our disease. Um, and the information, as well as providing a new generation of medicines, could also be used to allow us to diagnose disease much more effectively and potentially much earlier in the progression of the disease. All of these things adding up to really good news for us as potential patients because it means that we have less trial and error, we have less taking of drugs that are not going to impact on us positively, but we have drugs that we know because we have the evidence that they will help us in either addressing our disease or uh, in, other way, in other ways helping our, our progression. A lot of it is based on gathering data and information because information from just one person isn't very helpful. We need information from lots of people. And that whole area of science is another area where Scotland excels. So again, number one in the world around informatics, how you can gather, use, manipulate information to be able to generate lots of stuff that are hidden in that information that you need to access and that could be very valuable, particularly in health research. And informatics is something that we will talk about today or how data is used because the last thing I would want to see, for example, if I was in a clinical trial or just had gone to see my doctor. You know, I wouldn't like to see the headline in the Daily Mail in Scotland that uh, Scotland's chief scientific advisor found to have liver disease, probably due to over drinking, uh, for example. I think it couldn't possibly be true, but I wouldn't want that exposed in the newspaper. If that was unfortunately the case for me, then that's my private information. That's not for anybody else to know. And that, that is what happens to your medical records at the moment. They are private. They're, they're between you and your medical practitioner. 
And so this whole idea of governance around data and information is a really important one because we have to strike the right balance about using information and absolutely protecting privacy. So have we any advantages in Scotland? Well, we do, and I'm going to finish with this. Um, the first one, patient access and data. Um, we've got a stable population. People who live in Scotland seem to quite like it, despite the weather. Uh, we still stay here in Scotland. And many generations of us are here. That's a big advantage because we're, we're stable. However, we have rather poor, a rather poor health record. And so lots of diseases are prominent here. And so we have lots of potential subjects to look at diagnosing and treating disease in Scotland. So we have patient access and data. We also have centralised healthcare systems in Scotland, NHS Scotland. And that's fantastic because we can have uh, a disease register. So for example, in Scotland, uh, one of these disease registers at the moment has been developed for diabetes. Unfortunately, uh, mostly due to lifestyle, there's an increased incidence in diabetes in Scotland. And uh, I think just under 5% of our population suffers from diabetes. And that's about 239,000 people. And already 10,000 of those have signed up to be in a database so that they can provide information about them, their health, their diet, their treatment that can, could be used to help not just them, but other people suffering from diabetes to help us to control that disease. We've also got unique health informatics database. So when we're born, we're given something called the Community Health Index of the CHI number. And that stays with us all our life and allows our data to be linked electronically. And every disease we suffer from, every treatment that we receive, that can be uh, accessed anonymously to be able to find out uh, a little bit more about predis predisposition to disease and so on. So that's terrific. And that takes us from cradle to grave. So a really good idea. And we have a national collaboration, a partnership in translational medicine. So translation means taking it from the bench to the bedside. So it's great that our scientists are number one in the world. But if they're just producing all this knowledge and we do nothing about it, it's, that's kind of foolish of us to do. We should be grabbing onto that and making sure that everyone in Scotland can benefit from it. So there's a real opportunity in taking that partnership through to develop the best clinical care that we can offer here in Scotland for our nation's health, but also as a huge opportunity for Scotland <coughs> itself to have the big pharmaceutical companies come and work here because this is the best, best place for them to be. Now we do have already um, a genetic database in Scotland, entirely voluntary, called Generation Scotland. And Generation Scotland has some 24,000 family members who have signed up. So any of you could sign up if you were interested. You could just Google it on the website, Generation Scotland. And you volunteer, and you volunteer along with a brother or a sister, or your mum or dad, or your grandmother or granddad, or whoever, family members. And that gives us very valuable information to allow us to address diseases, uh, to understand them more, their progression, and how we can treat them. And there's another reason that we have an advantage here in Scotland, and this is my last comment. There is a UK data bank, uh, a biobank, which again gathers information genetically from people. Now in Scotland, when we ask people to consider joining up to Generation Scotland, about 24%, let's say a quarter of those approached, agreed to do it. Okay, so you might think that's not much, three quarters didn't. But that wasn't, that's not with a very effective campaign. I mean, it's not doing a lot of campaigning. It's just asking people normally through their GPs whether they would be interested in joining up. At UK level, the number of take-up from those approached by UK Biobank was only 9%. So there is something interesting in Scotland where people here could see the advantage for themselves but also can see the advantage for other people, for society, in being able to engage in things such as clinical research. So 
that's all I'm going to say to you. I hope it's helped set the scene a little about why this is a great place to do clinical research and also given you some insight into what the potential is. Um, we're doing great things at the moment. It's nothing like what we could do, but we need to understand how you feel about getting engaged in that sort of enterprise. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.